Welcome everybody to our second draft of the Fantasy in Frames Women's Best Ball Challenge. I'm Stacey Perez. I'm here from Fantasy in Frames and I have a very special guest here with me tonight as we live stream the Aaron Andrews Division Draft. We've got Eric Balkman from the FFPC. You probably know him as Balky. Welcome Balky. How are you doing tonight? Doing excellent. Excited for some uh, some fantasy football live draft stream action. I haven't done one of these in I, I think since like September last year. So this is good to knock the rust off. <laughs> I, same here. I was just thinking, I was like, man, it has been a minute since one. I've only done two drafts so far this year, mm -hmm. but um, I haven't done any best ball drafts so far this year. So I got I to gotta shake some of that rust off too. Um, guys, uh, Balky is the host of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour and the Rotoviz High Stakes Lowdown. You can also find him on the Better Network and on Football Guys. He is at Eric Balkman on the X. Follow him if you are not following him already. Um, I want to get into some of these ladies that are drafting here. I know I'm coming up here. I'm number nine, but we've got a few minutes before we get going or before I have to draft. And thank God I have loaded my queue. So fingers crossed. <laughs> they'll still all be there. Um, but out of the number one spot, we've got Alicia Hunt. She is a content writer for drroto.com and on the field. Number two, we've got Heather Ann. She is a multiple time uh, a Scott Fishbowl participant. Did somebody just take CJ Stroud and Jordan Love? I'm going to have to back to the girls because those were top of my queue. We're going to get back to that in a second. Uh, we've got Kelly Donovan coming in at number three. She is a fantasy football super fan. Uh, we have got Darcy, but you guys know her online as Dame Overboard. Erica Brown coming in at number five. She's a fantasy in frames analyst. She'll be joining us tonight as well. We've got Connie Weiss. She's also another super fan and the winner of our Scott Fishbowl 14 giveaway. And it looks like, oh, I'm on the clock next. Okay. I better hurry up. We've got Melissa Harris, uh, who just drafted Puka Nakua with her first overall. Uh, we have got, oh, she's a huge Packer fan, Balky. Um, we have got Gina Noble there at number eight, who just took Lamar. I am number nine. Let's see who the girls have left me with here. Hmm. You have, uh, let's see, we got six quarterbacks off the board, a running back and a receiver. This is super flex, so you would think you'd go quarterback here, but you do have some options. It's the first round, Stacey. You would think. Let me see. Who are my guys that are left here? I'm not sure that I love any of those quarterbacks. I still have 30 seconds left, so I can talk my way through this. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to go. This is not at all what I had um, on, my, on my sheet here, but – I mean, he was one of the number one wide receivers last year. So I'm going to go ahead and go wide receiver first. Just do a little zig where everybody else is zagging. And then throw it to Angie, who took Angie, Angie Richardson. So Angie Hatfield, Scott Fishbowl and Battle of the Sexes participant. Number 11 on the clock right now. We've got Britt Flynn from Fantasy Alarm. She's going to be joining us a little bit later. And last but not least, coming in at the 12th spot, we have got Jess Muto. She is Scott Fishbowl, Battle of the Sexes, and the Biscuit Bowl participant. So those are our girls that are drafting tonight. Ooh, Britt took Brees Hall. This is this is shaking up a little different than our draft the other night. Well, it's I mean, you you have three of these. So I, I think like everybody kind of has their guys. Always get your guys, what I always say. Yeah. Um, and and everybody's gonna be a little bit different. Like you could look at the previous night or the previous draft and see how certain players go, but because um, everybody's got their own, you know, different take on the first round because it's so early in the off season right now, you're, you, you're going to see more variance in the first couple rounds in drafts in February and March than you'll see in August and September, as you know, Stacey. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Well, so look, Ooh, I like that dolphin stack that Jess just did there. So she took Tyreek Hill and Tua and there goes Dak. And, you know, again, everybody just keeps stealing my guys. I was going to do a nice little, um, Cowboys stack and you know, the draft is not, not letting me do it. So I guess I'm just going to have to take what the draft uh, leaves me. Sure. I'm, I'm looking at, so we're, you're coming up, uh, at the two Oh four here tonight. <laughs> um, there are, there is one quarterback that is still out there, uh, who will not be named. That was pretty, uh, <laughs> was drafted pretty high in his career, uh, before he's coming back with a vengeance this year. But after that, I don't know if you want to take a quick, that quarterback is not there. Um, no, I take it back. There's two quarterbacks that are still mm -hmm. out there. That would make some sense here. So you're guaranteed one of them here after um, Angie Hatfield drafts. You're going to, if you want to, Stacey, and I don't know if you're going to do quarterback again, but you certainly could. 
Well, or not quarterback again, but just yeah. quarterback here in the second round. That was one of them. Joe Burrow goes to Andrew Hatfield. So there is one out there if, if you if you feel the need to to draft a guy with some with some wheels and who might have a big time uh, target to throw to after the NFL draft. He's available. That's, that's kind of what I was thinking. And normally I am not a Kyler Murray fan, but I think I'm going to try to be this year and hope that maybe uh, Marvin Harrison joins the Cardinals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, I mean, there's a possibility. I mean, like, well, again, I, I I don't like saying, you know, naming players that have not been drafted yet, but this is tight end premium, obviously, on the FFPC platform. So there is a potential that that or there's a potential pick for you in the third round, should you choose to utilize it that would that might pay off with that Kyler Murray pick. There is. And and I'm gonna go ahead and add him into my queue right now so that that doesn't get past me. Oh, he's already in my queue. Good job. <laughs> are you surprised that we are halfway through the second round? We've only seen one team go quarterback, quarterback to start things off. I know. I am kind of surprised by that, especially in a super flex. So guys that are out there watching that, you know, don't know, is this super flex tight end premium full PPR format? Um, so yeah, I am a little surprised that, you know, we Angie's the only one to, to pull the trigger on double tap. Uh, that, oh gosh, Connie taking my Sam Laporta from me. Um, you know, but yeah, I am, I am a little surprised, but with tight end premium, I'm a little surprised that Samuel Porter hasn't gone earlier. He lasted till the third round in our draft on Sunday. I'm looking at our, our never too early best ball, super flex best ball tournament data at the FFPC. And according to fantasy mojo, fantasy mojo.com, Darren Armani, Laporta is on average going as the first tight end off the board, but not until the early third round. So it, it like, Con, I, you know, Connie Weiss ma like made a decision tonight that she was going to go ahead and get Laporta on her team um, because Laporta wasn't coming back to her in the third. At least I wouldn't think. Yeah, he's definitely not coming back at all. Um, you know, I, I love Laporta last year so much. Do you worry, though, that he's a regression candidate last year? Just look like as he just I mean, he just overachieved so much. Yeah, I mean, even like the best players in the league, if if they have a career year or have a massive season, I don't care what their track record is. I always find it hard for them to duplicate that the following year. Now, the elite of the elites do it you know uh for, for the most part but anytime somebody like if McCaffrey has a big season or Mahomes or Kelsey like even those guys I'm always kind of like okay are they gonna do it again and Laporta's never done it before but he's never had the chance to do it before so I would assume that there would be some regression uh coming this season but wouldn't surprise me at all if he's still the number one tight end at the end of the season and I think you know I think on average in the FFPC he is being drafted as the number one tight end so it makes sense I think so too. And I wanted to ask you about Justin Jefferson. So, you know, he's coming in right here. Heather just took him as her second pick first receiver. Are you concerned at all? I mean, I'm pretty concerned the fact that he's got Sam Darnold back there and nobody else right now. I mean, it, it sounds like they're going to try to draft somebody, but I just, I just worry that, I mean, look how far he's dropped number one receiver last year. Now he's going all the way down to a uh, second round. Yeah, I mean, for as far as the, the players in the Superflex Never Too Early tournament, he's still going at wide receiver four. I had these concerns, Stacey, that you're sharing um, uh, about a month or so ago, and I was talking with Nelson Burbitt from Dynasty Depot on the High Stakes Fantasy Football Show, and I asked him about that, about Jefferson. He said, look, it doesn't matter who they have at quarterback there. Um, they're going to find ways to still keep Justin Jefferson as like a top three or a top four receiver. So if you want to ding them a little bit, that's fine. But he is so talented and so good. And and Kevin O'Connell is a good coach. I mean, he's going to know yeah. how to scheme the ball to Jefferson. So he kind of like poo-pooed the whole thing of Jefferson having a, a really bad season because of the quarterback. And I think he's right. I, I think Jefferson probably not going to be the number one receiver this year, but he's still going to have an, an elite season. Yeah. Well, Kelly taking Trey McBride as the number two receiver off the board. I don't blame her at all there. Uh, Kelly, that's okay. I will, I'll try to get my ears on the stack some other way. Um, Erica, we've got Erica Brown with us. Erica, I'm not going to put you on the show just yet because you are up in like two seconds. So don't want to do that to you. So as soon as you make your pick, I'm going to bring you on in. Um, but it looks like Darcy is on the board now. I, it's so funny. I don't ever call Darcy by her name, Darcy. We always call her Dame Overboard. Dame Overboard. Her. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see who she's going to get here. She's got Mahomes and Bijan. Um, we were making a joke earlier about, um, you know, all of us, you know, being so, you know, like, gosh, it's so early in the draft. You know, we haven't all drafted in a while. And 
Um, you know, what if we take Brian Robinson instead of Bajan Robinson? So <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it done. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. Right. <laughs> Ooh, um, Justin Herbert off the board. I think that's great value, honestly, right there. Like, how do you do you feel like they're I mean, obviously they don't have anybody right now, but I think things are gonna be totally different in LA, right? With Harbaugh there now. Yeah, this I think this is the time to get Herbert late, right? Because he's only gonna go up from here once they add another receiver, once they add another pass catcher. I mean, they could get Brock Bowers for 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 all intents and purposes, and that's going to make Herbert bounce back. Like, I don't think his value is going to be lower than it is right now. Quarterback 11, according to, to the mojo right now. So I, I think if you're going to draft Herbert, draft him now, because this is probably going to be the best value you're going to get on him during drafting season. Yeah, I think so too. All right. So Erica just made her pick. She took Jonathan Taylor. Erica, I'm going to bring you on in. Welcome to the show, everybody. We have got Erica Brown here, fantasy and frame. She is our dynasty bartender. Uh, Erica, how's it going? It's going good. I just got sniped. I had Justin Herbert in my queue for my next pick, and Not Darcy tonight. ended up taking him. So we, I'm telling you, we are full of sharks in this draft right now. I feel like every all my queue is just like has dwindled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there goes there goes Kelsey. I'm gonna be up next. Gina is up right now. Stacy, as long as you're contemplating your pick, Erica, let me ask you, uh, CJ Stroud versus Lamar Jackson, was that a difficult decision for you there uh, when you're picking at the 105? It was. I just like, I like Stroud a little better. Um, really no reason. I like his uh, receiving weapons better than Lamar's right now. So I prefer Stroud. Were you surprised that, uh, well, okay, now we're, Stacy and I were talking about this earlier, through the first two rounds, we only had one team go quarterback, quarterback. There's a lot of it's it's a rainbow board here, Erica. Were you surprised mm -hmm. to, to see that how that played out over the course of the first 24 picks? I'm actually surprised. I took a quarterback in the first round because I am habitually a late QB drafter, even in super flex. So I tend to wait till the very last moment. Um, I'm in a dynasty startup with some of the women here as well and i got dak as my first quarterback in the third round mm. in that startup so i i i don't value the quarterback position as much as other people and that well, makes I mean, perfect sense yeah i think that's great route value though on dak though that you got him in the third round was, I mean, yeah i was surprised right he fell that far yeah absolutely well, garrett wilson goes to angie uh we've got jared goff going to brit and uh, Jess is on the clock now. I promised myself that I would do a much better job trying to narrate the draft for the people that are going to be listening to this later on and not watching. Um, because on Sunday, I got halfway through the draft and I realized, you know what? I, I don't think that we've talked about picks or anything like that. We've just been talking about different things. And um, I, I was like, oh, I feel terrible for the people that are just listening to this. They're going to have no idea what's going on. <laughs> you know what's what's crazy? And and Erica, I, I don't know if you felt this way when the board came to you at, at 208, but Wide receiver three in the FFPC Never Too Early Best Ball Tournament is Jamar Chase, and he normally goes at the 112, and that's obviously super flex as well. You get him all the way at the 208. Was this a a, a rush to the podium to make the pick selection there? Where How surprised are you to see Chase still on the board? Uh, super surprised, and I was between him and Jefferson, and you guys had mentioned talking about Jefferson right before that, and I was like, nope, Chase, I know who his quarterback is. I know – He's a decent player, so grab him real quick. I, and, I, and I wonder why that is, like why he slipped. I don't know if it's like – I know there's some people that are still concerned about, you know, the, the, the burrow wrist or, you know, injury, whatever he had last year affecting him. Um, and I don't know. I mean, maybe that's founded. Maybe it's not. But to see Chase go this late – and, you know, honestly, guys like, you know, Puka Nakua and, and Amon Ross St. Brown going before him. That's fine. I mean, it's it's all it's get your guys season, as Stacy just did. I'll let you talk about that in a second. But man, Chase at the 208, that's one of my favorite picks of the draft so far. Excited for that one. I'm surprised Puka was the number one wide receiver overall. I know, I know. You know, I don't I don't blame him. I mean, Puka did. I mean, what I think I had a nice little stat on him. He was the sixth most targeted wide receiver overall last year. Um you know, right behind Amon Ross St. Brown. So, I mean, he's going to get the volume. I, I think the other thing too, with, with Nakua, um, there are some people out there and, and I'm not, and it's fine if you are one of those people that they still believe in cup, that, that it was just a down year for cup. And he is not, 
you know, on the decline of his career, that he's still ready to put up big numbers. And if you do believe that, then you're not going to draft Nakua that high. But there's a lot of people out there that do believe that Cup is on the downside and that he is, you know, that we've seen the best and and he's not going to bounce back and Nakua is on the upswing. And if you believe that, then I get why you would take Nakua not only in the first round, but as the first receiver off the board too, Stacey. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And I mean, any of these guys right here, you know, Puka, CD, Tyreek, they're still going to put up monster numbers for you. So I'm going to ask Brown. He was going to be one of my guys as well. Um, you know, so I, I don't have any issue with that. If that's your guy, go mm-hmm. by all means, go get him. Yeah. Er- Erica, you just went another receiver here too. And this is an interesting player. Um, you got him right at ADP, uh, at the 408, but man, we have seen Drake London really move up the draft board yeah. since, since the Kirk Cousins signing. Um, and now you get Chase and London, uh, catching passes from CJ Stroud on this team. This this has mm-hmm. the makings of a juggernaut here. I like the start, and I don't play a ton of best ball. Um, last year was really my first time doing any kind of best ball drafts, so I'm still new to the to the format. But I'm liking this build so far. Yeah, I'm I'm really digging your team. I'm a huge CJ Stroud fan. I mean, the Texans overall. I mean. I think Abalki, they might be my second favorite team besides the Packers at this really? point. Really? I think so. They're so fun to watch. I mean, yeah. Nick Stroud, Nico Collins, Tank Dell. Um, I, I love those guys. I think they're just, they're a blast. And then, you know, I think later on here, I'm curious to see where, where Joe Mixon goes, you mm-hmm. know, now that he's in a new environment. I'm, I'm not, you know, it wasn't the biggest Joe Mixon fan, you know, obviously last year, but this year I'm kind of in on him. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, new place. He's going to be the guy. Damian Pierce looked not great at all last year. You guys, I like, I like, I like the pick Erica too, uh, of you getting Jonathan Taylor at the three Oh five. I love and, and it's, it's different in football a little bit, but I, I think in baseball, I love drafting proven players coming off bad years. Right. Um, right. where you can, where you can buy the dip on them and Taylor, I think you could definitely buy the dip. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that he was, you know, the one Oh one, and now you're getting him here in, in, in the mid third, as well as your, as your anchor running back. Probably I don't know how much you thought about that. I mean, obviously you you were looking at, or I mean, Kyron Williams was still out there, Barkley, uh, Achan. I mean, those guys were all still out there. How difficult was it to to, to pick Taylor if you were looking at running back there? Um, or were you considering players at other positions too? Like that's yeah. You know? Um, I just liked his value there. Um, I wanted at least one solid running back, and then I'm probably going to go heavy wide receiver and quarterback the next couple rounds so then i can get a late round running back um yeah i just wanted like that one one main guy to begin with Mm -hmm. there we go you are going to be up in a couple picks here erica um let's see oh aaron Rodgers. there we go he's not going to be the vice presidential candidate so he's got time to play was that official i i stopped following that story so so who did rfk pick Obviously I, not Rogers, some, huh? Some attorney, I think, from California. I don't know. I just yeah. saw the headline and I was like, oh, it's not Rogers. I don't care anymore. <laughs> um, <so. laughs> we can start drafting him with confidence once again. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, as much as you can draft a 40 year old quarterback with confidence, you know. Man. Yeah. Coming off an injury like that, too. Right. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. A little stressed um, about that. But you know what, though? I think, I think they're going to, I, I mean, Garrett Wilson, right? I mean, you think you still have to take him as high as you're taking him? Let's see. He went here in the third, um, you know, on on Angie's team. I mean, he's still going to be a huge target monster. He's still going to get those points. Erica, I swear, if you keep taking my Texans, I'm going to come across that screen. (laughs) I I had to. I mean, I had a pair tank with uh, with Stroud there. You do. And you know, it's wild. So, like, who would have thought, right? Nico Collins going in the third round. I, you know, I mean, he did have a great year last year. But, wow, he's just blown right up those draft boards. Um, and you can't really wait too much longer to get Tank Dell. I mean, this is this is basically where he's going. Erica, how do you? I mean, because you drafted Tank Dell here. How do you? I mean, what's the disparity for you for fantasy production this year between Collins and Tank Dell? I mean, is it two rounds worth? Are you actually getting a deal here on Tank Dell? I don't think so. I mean, they. I th- I view them as pretty evenly. I kind of view them as more of a Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and their prime mm-hmm. type of duo. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, like I said, I mean, I'm a huge, huge Tank Dell fan. Um, 
But I mean, yeah, I think those guys are going to be really, really close by the end of the season. Just the don't season. don't have Tank Dell blocking in the backfield again. That's the last thing we need. <laughs> oh my gosh, he weighs 180 pounds. Like, what are we doing? What are we doing, Texans? Come on, you got other- the other thing that I think is interesting, and I heard this, I think Theo Greminger mentioned this on, I think it was the Dynasty Life podcast, and he said, and I didn't know this, and I haven't had a chance to research it, but apparently Keenan Allen was pretty close to going to the Houston Texans. And mm-hmm. if that's the case, hey, you know, wheels up for C.J. Stroud. But it didn't happen. That doesn't mean that Houston might, I mean, maybe they look at another receiver on maybe not day one, but day two of the draft. And if they draft another receiver on day two of the draft, that's great news for Stroud, but I don't know what that does for Collins and, and Dell. Again, if that happens, we're mm-hmm. drafting, you know, whatever it is a month before the NFL draft. But I do think that's interesting knowing that, um, and I have heard that Houston is looking at, you know, adding another pass catcher prior to that Keenan Allen thing. So it could be an amazing offense, which Erica, you'll love because you have Stroud on your team. Yes, that'll be perfect. <laughs> Um, Balky, I wanted to get your opinion on the Josh Jacobs signing in Green Bay. How do you how do you feel about that? Because I my was a little I was a little sad that Aaron Jones had to leave, but I don't know, I'm pretty excited. The more I the more I get used to Josh Jacobs coming in, and, and Aaron Jones going to be wearing you know purple and gold next year. Yeah, the the feeling in Northeast Wisconsin before this before free agency happened was whatever they do, they have to sign Aaron Jones. Even the Packers beat writers were, I think Matt Schneidman from the athletics said it's like 99.999% chance that Aaron Jones comes back to green Bay. And then depending upon who you believe, um, you know, negotiations hit a snag and Mm -hmm. they basically decided to go with Josh Jacobs. Kind of, it would kind of reminded me of when um, Jared cook wanted to sign for a a certain amount to resign with green Bay and uh, Packers weren't having it. They said, this is what we'll, we'll do. And they said, well, you know, we don't know. And then they went out and got signed Martellus Bennett. And I think yeah. that's sort of the thing with Jacobs. Now, it's only like a one-year contract, maybe a two-year contract with like a, a team option in the second year. Mm-hmm. But this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Um, you have a proven player coming off a bad year, a guy who led the league in rushing in 2022. And then in 2023, my goodness, it, his team was awful. Uh, never had any kind of consistency at quarterback. The, the coach got fired at the OC got fired. Um, and, and he was dealing with some injuries as well. He's only 26 years old and he, that's three years or four years younger. I think than Aaron Jones, a guy that even be, prior to the free agency, um, you know, stuff that was happening. I, I said like, this guy got hurt three times last year, opening yeah. game, middle of the season. And then he got hurt in that Niners playoff game too. And they're all soft tissue injuries. And these are not things that you can kind of cure as you get older. And, He's ancient for a running back. So for me to, for the Packers to, to get, again, it's not a 48, they're not paying Josh Jacobs 48 million. That figure will get adjusted over the next couple of years. So I I love it for, for, for this year. I think it's going to be great. I think Josh Jacobs is a top five running back this year. I don't know about Aaron Jones in Minnesota though. Yeah. We'll we'll get back to that in a second, but I I know Ann wanted to talk to you real quick about get your thoughts on Kyle Pitts this season. Um, How are you feeling about him? I hope yeah, you're feeling well, I just took him. Right. Well, what's interesting <laughs> about him is, um, who, help me out, uh, ladies. Who was who's the new head coach for Atlanta? Was it Raheem Morris? Right? Yes. He got hired. Raheem. Okay. Yes. Okay. So he gets hired, and one of the first questions he was at his, at his press conference is, you know, who are the best offensive players on your team? He mentioned Drake London. He mentioned Bijan Robinson. He did not mention Kyle Pitts, um, which I thought was interesting. Kyle Pitts now has a real quarterback, a guy that has has thrown the the ball to the tight end over the course of his career pretty well and we know that Pitts is is an incredible athlete and he's he's been able to do it when he's had the opportunity Mm -hmm. for whatever reason and maybe it's because people have been burned by him so much over the course of his career he's tight end seven in a tight end premium league going at the middle to the end of the sixth round I like that value Um, I think for anybody who's a volume drafter you should be getting some some Kyle Pitts on your teams this year and to get him at this price uh, Stacy, I think it's it's pretty good. He's another one of those players that I think as we get deeper into drafting season, he's going to move up. And now you have him here in the sixth, was it the sixth or fifth round you got him in? Um, mm-hmm. You get him in the fifth round. I mean, he might ascend further than that going forward. Um, now, take it for what you will. I've basically been wrong about Kyle Pitts every single year uh, so far <laughs> of his career, but I, I do like him this year. I like where he's going. I, I kind of feel like, you know, if you haven't been in on him, you know, rightly so over the last few years, 
But I feel like this is, you know, new system, like you said, new quarterback. And we know, you know, Kirk loves to throw to his tight end. So I'm okay. Let's take him this year. If it doesn't work out, then I think we can all get off the Kyle Butts. Well, Kyle it, Pitts, but that is a great point because when has he ever been set up like he is being set up mm -hmm. this year? Like right. if, if it doesn't work out for him this year, like this is a Pitts problem. Mm -hmm. This isn't an Arthur Smith problem. It's not a Falcons problem. It's a Pitts problem at this point. So it really is a put up or shut up year for him in fantasy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. How do you feel about Jaden Reed uh, going before Christian Watson? I I like it. And I think that the, the feeling here for fans of the Packers, I, in fact, I ran a, a an X poll um, a few weeks ago and I said, who's going to be the number one receiver for the Packers this year. Overwhelmingly, it was Jaden Reed. Um, I know the Packers brought in the, a former assistant strength and conditioning coach uh, for the Niners who was a specialist in soft tissue injury. He has to be, he's kept Christian McCaffrey upright um, and on the field for like the last wow. year and a half. Right. So I think there's something to that. Christian Watson actually dropped this in one of his post-game pressers. Um, the middle part of this past season that he spent tens of thousands of dollars of his own money trying to find out, why he can't stay healthy with these with these hamstring issues that he's been having. And at yeah. this point, I'm kind of like, you know, I, I need to see it again before I start investing in him. Jaden Reed was a rookie last year, and Jordan Love threw to him a ton. Uh, yeah. He's not the most prolific athlete in the world, but he catches a lot of passes. He caught touchdowns last year. He was a trusted guy. I think he's only going to get better. I fully support drafting Jaden Reed ahead of Christian Watson for sure. Yeah, he was one of my, one of my you know, I mean, obviously like a little biased with the Packers, but one of my favorite picks, you know, going into the season, you know, especially too many could get him off waivers. If you, you know, were in a draft where, you know, people didn't take, you know, him right away. Um, I see Alicia went back to back rookies here with Jonathan Brooks and Malik neighbors. And um, I'm, I'm liking that she's got Caleb Williams too um, on her team. Do you guys have any feelings as far as like how many is too many when it comes to rookies? Yes. I, I, I think Scott Connor from Dynasty Trades and Five would tell you there's there's never there's no limit like that guy. And I yeah. think he's right. I, I think like, again, once these rookies have homes and they're on teams, you're going to see them all significantly move up the board. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of rookies that are going to tumble in draft value um, after the NFL draft. So now is the time to get them. Uh, Brooks now Brooks in the sixth I think ladies is kind of interesting because he tore that ACL I know he says he's going to be ready in time for week one but that I never trust the player talking about his own injury but I would say too because of this class he probably is the most talented running back in this class as well yeah Erica you just took uh Zay Flowers with your last pick there so you know you've got Chase London Tank Dell and Zay Flowers and you just got like a prolific receiving core here going. That's kind of how I draft anyway, even in redraft and uh, dynasty. So I figured let's try it with best ball. Yeah. Um, Balky, it's funny you mentioned um, Scott Connor because I always like to see, especially when we're in Kentucky drafting, like the teams that he and Jay uh, read do together. And, you know, I can always tell like who is in charge of that draft because <laughs> I had a ton of rookies. I know that was a Scott team. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it always is. And that's, that's the fun and madness of co-owning a team, but they've been doing it together for years. They've had a lot of success doing it. Um, and, and so they, and they, they know how to, uh, you know, when, when to bounce ideas off each other and when, when one guy needs to back down from the other one on, on a pick. So um, Erica, let, just real quick that the David and Joku pick here, he's your number one tight end. I think, what am I looking at? Ninth tight end off the board here mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the sixth round. One of the things, and, and I have Ninjoku on, on a few teams already this year, but I, I want to get your thoughts. A lot of the production he had was with Joe Flacco last year. I shouldn't say a lot, but a significant amount was with Flacco, but now we have Deshaun Watson. But, I mean, you're drafting him here. It, it makes me think, it makes me feel better about my Njoku shares because you believe, like, look, Regardless of the quarterback, the goodness will continue here for Njoku, right? I mean, I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope that's where it goes. <laughs> but I was staring down him and uh, Kittle as my number one tight end. So I don't know. I like Njoku's opportunities better than Kittle's. I like that pick a lot, too. I mean, he really came on last year. And I mean, I'm, I'm not really concerned about Jerry Judy. 
Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, and the Judy thing, the Judy thing's wild. Like, I mean, the trade I get, but that extension they signed him to. Holy it's cow. Insane. Like, how are they just printing money in Cleveland? Like they're giving Deshaun <laughs> Watson all this money and Trey Judy all this money. Like, where is it all coming from? It it makes me feel good as a Milwaukee Bucks fan because Jimmy Haslam is now part owner of the Bucks. So if he's tossing around money to guys like Jerry Judy, I know he's going to be willing to pay the luxury tax to get an NBA championship in Milwaukee. So that, <laughs> so go. that, that, that makes me feel good uh, about it. Uh, in Joku. Um, I'm looking at, uh, or about uh, the Browns in general, what tipped the scales Erica for you and Joku versus Kittle? Why did you end up going with Njoku? I've honestly, I've never really liked Kittle like in fantasy wise, um, especially later in his later years now um he's just i feel like he's not as productive as he could be or as he should be so you know what's going to be interesting <laughs> there too is is i don't think they move brandon Ayuk, but certainly there's something going on there right now if they do and he's not on that team and we we know debo samuel is no stranger to the training uh the trainer's room and if that happens i mean like it could be huge for mccaffrey and kittle if kittle's going to be counted on as the number one or number two option for long stretches of the season. That's, that's going to be interesting to watch. Stacy, you went um, dolphin in the six, you I went did. dolphin in the seventh. We're going to make it three dolphins in a row here. I don't know who you would pick, but I, I, you know, I think Skylar Thompson might still be available. I can yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's um, super flex. Dan Marino's out there. Grab him. Um, no, you know, it was, it was wild. One of the girls who was in the, uh, Rachel, uh, on the Sunday draft got Moster at such great value. And I think she's in the chat. She can remind us where she got him. Um, but it just kind of was something that was sticking in my head. Cause I tend to draft right running back a little bit later as well. Um, you know, I was like, who can I get? That's got really good value, really good upside, lots of potential. I know is going to be playing as long as he's not hurt, you know, like knock on, knock on wood over here. Um, so, you know, I was like, Raheem Mostert, he's on a great offense. Like, why not? Let's go. Um, let's see. I've got 30 seconds left. <laughs> let's see. Do I, do, I don't know that I want another running back again this early. Well, okay. Uh, I'm just, I'm not, I'm just going to say, I'm not going to push in any direction. Yeah. Say you don't want another running back this early. You only have one running back. It's not like you have an embarrassment. Like it wouldn't be that wild to take another running back here. <laughs> be terrible i've got my my don't guys don't worry my cue is set so it's if okay. i get the guy that i'm getting here it's totally fine um <laughs> ooh, that's kind of fun let's do that david montgomery oh there you go from the lions um yeah you know i think look at this like gibbs went in the third montgomery i'm taking him down here in the eighth and i mean i don't have the numbers in front of me but those guys you know weren't that far off from each other last year yeah, it, it, it's wild. I'm I'm looking at the ADP for the never too early Superflex tournament with the FFPC. Jameer Gibbs 209, David Montgomery 806. Um, yeah, that is a that's a pretty big disparity between those two players. And I guess Gibbs is the more electric uh, playmaker, but you know you're also paying a premium for him. Where mm -hmm. Montgomery should get a decent amount of goal line, if not all goal line. Um, he's not decrepit. I mean, he's still <laughs> relatively young somewhat young for a running back. I, I, it's, that's a pretty big distance between Gibbs and Montgomery. And I don't know if the numbers back that up. I think Montgomery might be a nice little buy for people right now. Yeah. I like the Roma Dunze pick from Gina too, right here. He's one of my favorite rookie receivers. I probably would have taken him if I hadn't taken Marvin um, earlier, but I just, I, I just, I, I think I've said it every time that I talk about Roma Dunze is that he had just has this like amazing contested catch rate. It's like the highest mm -hmm. out of this entire rookie class right now. I think it's like 75%, um, which is my favorite stat of all time. I, I can't explain it. I just really enjoy a good contested catch rate stat. And there goes Watson off the board too. That yeah, was, finally. That was, um, what pick was that? That was 806 that we're yeah. looking tonight to uh, Melissa Harris a huge Packers fan. Uh, so no surprise that she, you know, you look at, at, at her team, former Packer Devontae Adams, former Packer Aaron Jones. Now she gets the current Packer Christian Watson. Well, look at that. So, you know, that's, that's fine. Like, look, I love Devontae. I love Aaron Jones. Those are two of my favorite Packers of all time. Like I just yeah. love those guys. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to go Packer or Packer adjacent, no issue with those two. 
Erica, you had the opportunity to take, and I, I want to make sure I'm seeing this right. Yeah. The third quarterback off the board, and you chose Drake May over J.J. McCarthy. And I'll back this up and just say I would have done the same thing. But McCarthy's getting a lot. Of, he's being steamed up a little bit as far as NFL draft circles. Um, but May was the pick here for you. Why mm -hmm. Why was it? And, and we don't have to narrow it down to rookie quarterbacks. Look at the quarterbacks that went right after Deshaun Watson and Derek Carr. Why was May the selection for you there? Uh, it was between May and Watson, really. Um, and I just went May because even though we don't know where he's going, he's going to get an opportunity to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm confident in that. And I just like to see what he can do. So just an experiment there. Stacy, how does remind me how this? So you have three full leagues. Do the do yeah. the leagues ever like combine at the end at like for like a championship run, or is this just every that's just one champion per league? Yeah, so it's going to be one champion per league, and then we're I'm going to go through and kind of manually figure out who's going to be the number one overall team right. um, there. And so not, not tournament kind of, kind of, I'm calling it a tournament, but that's kind of the idea, but um, again, not, they're not actually going to be all put in together. Um, so, uh, so how does that, I mean, does that change the stacking strategy for either of you in this? Uh, Stacey, I'll throw it to you since Erica's going to be on the clock here a little bit. Does that change the, the stacking strategy? Because you only have to beat out 11 other teams rather than, you know, a bunch of teams. So I, I mean, I do enjoy a nice stack um, and it's, it's, you know, if you're playing in those huge tournaments, um, obviously really important to get your stacks there and, you know, to correlate your teams mm -hmm. and everything, especially with the later, you know, ends of the, um, you know, the season. But when in a self-contained kind of tournament like this, it's not really that important. I don't have an issue if you don't want to stack at all. Um, you know, like I've got a couple things here and there, but it's not, you know, it's not my focus. It's not my number one priority to make sure that I've got, you know, CD with Dak, with Jake Ferguson, right. with, you know, a Rico Dowdle at the end, who I guess is their starting running back. I don't, I don't know what's happening. Know. In Dallas, but, I, I mean, yeah. well, that, that's the thing. How excited I, and like what we, I mean, there's rookie running backs, plenty of rookie running backs out there, but that's, I think that, and I don't know. I mean, like, I think as much as people in Los Angeles are talking up Gus Edwards, I can't imagine that's their plan a this year, as much as they'd like right. us to believe that it is. But man, that whoever the chargers draft at running back, whoever the Cowboys draft at running back, mm -hmm. That is going to be interesting. I just saw a report right before we went on tonight that, and I don't know if this was an agent field report at all, but that Dalvin <laughs> Cook and Ezekiel Elliott are potentially uh, in the Cowboys plans this year too. So I don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. there. I, those guys at best are one B's, but they're probably twos at this point. So they're at, at the point that they're at both at in their career right now. Oh man. Well, I was about to cut Dalvin Cook in uh, one of my dynasties. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what honestly, what what did he show us last year that would mm -hmm. that that gives you any kind of faith that he's going to be a difference maker this year? You know, he's not yeah. like I would much rather take chances on these these rookie running backs that are going to be going early on day three than I would Dalvin Cook this year. Oh yeah, I mean, at one point, like I completely forgot that he was uh, with Baltimore. You know, like this wasn't doing anything, like, you know, not that I mean, they, they, you know, makes all about that big deal signing with the Jets and going to Baltimore. He goes somewhere else too. Am I forgetting like a third team that he was with? I'll look it up. I don't think you are though. It, it was just like, uh, what? I guess there's zero, you know, gas in the tank there. Um, and then, you know, especially poor Alexander Madison, you know, everybody thought, okay, well, Davin Cook's gone now, it's his time to shine. And shine, he did not, unfortunately. So now he'll be shining in Vegas, hopefully. We'll see. <laughs> Let me do something in Vegas. Hopefully, stay in, stay on the trip. Um, man, this is a QB run over here. I was, I was thinking I was safe. I was like, I'm gonna get Gino as my third quarterback later. Um, Angie or Alicia ruined my plan there. Um, so, guys, this is kind of gross. Um, well, it's not really gross. We don't know where he's gonna go, and I know we were just talking about him here. But as a third quarterback, I'm gonna go ahead and roll the dice. On JJ McCarthy mm. and hope and hope I'll just cross my fingers and hope real hard that, that turns out okay. I'm trying to count up the quarterbacks that are off the board right now. And I think we have I think we have 31 quarterbacks. I think that was a 31st quarterback drafted. So yeah. 
for yes. anybody who's trying to load up on a, a third quarterback, you, you kind of got to get them now. And now there's 32 after Jess Muto just took Sam Darnold at, at the nine 12. So now we have 32 quarterbacks off the board. Now it's kind of slim pickings, but I mean, both of you guys, like Stacy, you got three of them and Erica, you obviously took, took Stroud in the first round and, and Drake may, I, I mm-hmm. think, I, I don't think there's any reason. And that's, it's your team. I don't think there's any reason to, draft another speculative uh, third quarterback at this point, but you certainly could that the problem is with like super flex, like once they're gone, they're kind of gone. And then you just got to hope if, if you're, if you're going to take another quarterback and, and I usually like when I'm drafting super flex, that's kind of like at this point, I'm, I'm focusing on tight ends. I'm focusing on receivers, you know, um, maybe some flyer running backs because it's, it's, it's tough to sell me on a quarterback now for the second half of this draft. Mm-hmm. Um, Stacy. Uh, you have a um, post from Ann Dunn. We could probably talk to Erica about DeAndre Swift is uh, yes. is her ninth round pick. Let's see. Yeah, ninth round pick. So I got I to gotta be honest. When I saw that signing, I really wasn't sure what Chicago was doing. I was like, wait a minute. We have Khalil Herbert. We've got Roshan. You know, like, why are we signing, you know, DeAndre Swift there? Mm-hmm. Um, so I was a little confused, you know, by that pick. But. You know, I mean, he's not, he's, he's a good, he's a good running back. If you're going to wait a little bit, he's got some upside to him, maybe not as, you know, dynamic as we, you know, had like originally thought coming out of college, but if like Erica, he's your number two, like, and you got him in the ninth round, like that's phenomenal value. And he's going to be on, you know, what supposedly, or what it looks like is to be a, a good Chicago bears team. At least you're trying to put the pieces together to support Caleb Williams there. So, I mean, I, I think that's a great pick, great value where you got him. Um, Angie took Javante Williams for me. So I am going to go with uh, Jalen Warren there and be done at running back for a while. <laughs> I want to get back to the Swift thing too, Erica, because you had Taylor and then Swift, you get, you basically get us. I mean, what I think is going to be a starting running back who catches passes in the mm-hmm. ninth round, you had to be hopping all over that. Were you considering any other picks there in the ninth? Um, I wasn't because I knew I needed another running back and I didn't really like Najee and Warren. So didn't know who's going to be the quarterback in Denver. So I went with Swift and I'm also a Chicago bears fan. So, Oh, even better. So we'll forgive you, Erica. It's okay. Um, No one's perfect. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm just kidding. No, that I think, you know, that, that bears offense is going to be interesting this year. I mean, we've already got, now Keenan Allen's on that team to, to go along with DJ Moore. Cole Komet, nobody ever talks about Cole Komet, and maybe it's because he's more of a an accumulator than a dynamic playmaker, but he still puts up numbers. And now Swift to go with Roshan Johnson, and, and then obviously we assume it's Caleb Williams that is going to be the starting quarterback there. I think there's a lot to like uh, in, in Chicago. In fact, I think I just saw, um, was it DraftKings, or who put out the um, the win totals Um for uh, recently, I think it was either yesterday or today for the NFL, and they have the Bears at eight and a half, which is, I mean, they go nine and nine and eight, or or even eight and nine in Caleb Williams' first year with with that talent. I think you really got to be liking what the Bears are doing there. I have oh, yeah. got to be excited about that. You got to feel bad for Justin Fields though, because he's got to be thinking like, "Hey man, where was where was all this help when I was there?" You know. <laughs> well, I, I, it's similar to the Aaron Rodgers thing because they, you know, the yeah. Packers trade Rodgers to the Jets, and then all of a sudden they. They're drafting Jaden Reed and they're drafting, uh, you know, Musgrave mm-hmm. and Tucker Craft and all these guys. I, I think it's interesting. Um, Calvin Ridley, Erica, 10th mm-hmm. round. What can you tell us about him? Um, I like the value there. I mean, mm-hmm. he got a big deal. So we know he's going to be a really good, you know, weapon for Will Levis. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to see what he can do, possibly. Yeah, it's, it's always – like anytime I see somebody get big money, like I, I know it, it shouldn't affect how I view them as a player, but it does, you know, and, and like we, we talked about Jerry Judy earlier, like it always has me question like, okay, what should I be? Should I be raising this guy up because of the investment that the team is making to this player and the team made a huge investment in, in, in the Tennessee Titans to, to Calvin Ridley. Um, and you do have, um, the other receiver there who I don't know, I don't believe he is off the board yet. So I will not mention him, um, but he's not exactly a spring chicken anymore. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot to like about uh, Ridley in, in, in Tennessee and in the 10th round where you got him for sure. 
I have a quick question about what you guys think about the potential in Tennessee. So like last year we were getting in best ball, like Houston stacks so cheap at the end of our drafts last year, you know, Stroud and Dell and um, Nico and some other guys. Like, and I'm wondering like what teams have that potential to be like our cheap, sneaky guys that we can get towards the end. Um, and I'm wondering if Tennessee might be one of those, of those teams. I think they are. Um, it would, I mean, like you're talking about, um, so where did Levis go in this? So Levis went in the eighth mm -hmm. and then you didn't have Ridley go until the 10th. Um, obviously we haven't seen the tight end or the receiver go off the board. So I think that's a good one, uh, for sure. Right there. Um, I don't, you know, it's weird because like, I would say all oh, the Vikings, but because of the quarterback, but everybody else goes much higher than the quarterback. So it can't really be a cheap stack unless you fall into Sam Darnold, you know, uh, midway through the draft. And, and I don't think it always works that way. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think um, New Orleans could be one with Derek Carr, kind of not because of Olave, but, you know, whatever else they do at receiver there. I think that could be interesting, but certainly not a, 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 a something I want to hitch my wagon to at all. Yeah, no, it, it nothing about them like really makes me super excited. But I was just kind of thinking about that the other day. I was like, I wonder who's going to be our Houston for you know this coming season. Well, what about what about uh, what about Pittsburgh with with Russell Wilson and, and yeah. what did George Pickens? George Pickens is a ninth round pick here. So was was yeah. Wilson in the ninth? Yeah, they were both ninth round picks. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm that could be one for. Uh, uh, the the tight end in Pittsburgh is probably going to be going later as well. So, or no, he went in the uh, Friermuth already went in the ninth. Wow, so you had three Pittsburgh Steelers all go in the ninth round. Um, and then, no, four. Najee Harris went there too. Oh, and then I took Jalen Warren in the tenth. It's just it's wild. That was that's the that's the Pittsburgh section of the draft apparently. So yeah, I mean I, I think that's one as as well you could look at. Um, and then potentially as we don't know, I mean we we're pretty sure we know where Caleb Williams is going, but. Uh, with Jaden Daniels and JJ McCarthy and Drake May, that could turn into one as well. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think we, were you guys shocked that um, Johnu Smith didn't end up in Pittsburgh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and who did today? Cordero Patterson oh. is now a Pittsburgh Steeler. They're so. just trolling us now. That's Arthur Smith is continuing to troll the fantasy community. I am one hundred percent certain of it. You cannot convince me otherwise. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I, I, and listen. So, did John U. Smith sign with anybody? I don't even know. Miami. Oh, he signed he's, with the Dolphins. He's okay. Starting tight end in Miami, according to their depth chart right now. That's wild. That Isn't is that wild. crazy? Yeah, that's that, that's oh, something. All right, um, Erica, you ended up drafting a tight end that I have um, a decent amount of dynasty shares of mm -hmm. um, in Michael Mayer. How big of a step forward do you think he's going to make in in his sophomore season? Are, are we are we going to see something that's fantasy difference making, especially for you got him in the eleventh round? I mean, I hope so. I didn't really like any of the tight ends after him, especially Waller. You know, didn't see much from Waller last year. Um, who else was on the board? K. Dotton, Isaiah Likely. You know, he could have opportunity, but I didn't really see any other tight end that I really liked besides Mayer. So. I'm hoping he can take a step forward, depending on who the quarterback is. I like the pairing of Njoku too and 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 Mayer because you have you have the young, up and coming you know upside pick of of Mayer, and you have sort of this veteran. We kind of know what he's capable of presence of of David and Joku. So that pairing there, I think, is going to be interesting. Stacy, what what are you doing? Oh, you already did. You already you already. Yeah. You took I, the, the I, tight end that, that was not good enough not for good. Erica. Yeah. You take Kate Otten here. What do you like about him? It Well, it, it, I liked that he was available and that he's their starting <laughs> tight end. Um, that's probably as far as I'm going to get with the what, what do I like about Kate Otten. Um, is, he, is, he, is he your number three or number two tight end? Two. He's my number two. I waited. I was I was think I was hoping Jake Ferguson would make it back to me, and he did not. And then I waited a little bit longer, and Britt, who is uh, waiting in the wings over here for us, took TJ Hawkinson, uh, which our minds were like melding in that regard there. Um, wow. And then Luke Musgrave went, and he was another another one that I was eyeing. Um, so Kate Otten, let's <laughs> go to Tampa Bay. I need to. Yeah. <laughs> um, Erica, just, I want to say thank you so much for taking your time and joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me guys. I appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Anytime you are welcome anytime and um, tell the people where they can find you on social. Yeah. So um, you can find all of my fantasy content over at fantasyandframes.com. And I'm America 108 on Twitter or X, whatever you call it. Nice. Well, have a good rest of your draft and uh, we will be seeing you another time uh, soon. All right. Okay. Thanks guys. Bye. You know, oh. the other thing too, and Dunn posted this in, in the YouTube chat about the sneaky tight end pick in it, especially in tight end premium. And I don't know if I have a good one this year. Um, I, I think that, um, Andrew Cooper, the tight end whisperer from, uh, from fantasy alarm might be a little bit better of a guy to ask, but I, I, I think, you know, not to sound like a Homer, but I think there's potential with both Musgrave and Kraft this year. Uh, yeah. Musgrave is, is a guy who dealt with some injuries last year. And, and I know one of them was, you know, a, 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 a lacerated kidney or pancreas. That was or something. Wild. And so yeah. I, I don't think you, you glean anything from that. I don't think you yeah. say, Oh, this is, you know, he can't stay healthy, but he did have some other stuff. I know he had the concussion mm -hmm. and, and craft. I don't, you know, even when he took over, he wasn't a guy that, um, you know, had top five upside, but he is a guy that has top 12 upside if Musgrave is out. So I think he'd yeah. be interesting late. I kind of like Tyler Conklin, uh, mm -hmm. with the jets, uh, late again, he, he's like a number three tight end for me. Um, but tight end premium, they get gobbled up. I'm not a huge Waller guy. I, I, I'm kind of with Erica on that one. Like I've, I've seen enough. The guy's talking about potentially retiring. And yeah. when, who I think it's Cecil Lammy from football guys always says like, once you think about retiring, you're already retired, you know? So I, I don't, it, it's tough for me to get on board with him this year, but yeah, other than that, I don't know if I have a, a sneaky, sneaky tight end. Um, Davis Allen, maybe in for the Rams, Ooh. with Higby coming off that injury. That's a yeah. potential uh, possibility. That's a good one. I'm going to bring our next guest, Britt Flynn, on and see who she's got for some sneaky tight ends. Britt, what's up? How's your night going? Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. I sound a little little rough. Uh, been dealing with some COVID, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm here and I'm drafting. So nothing can stop the draft. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys doing? Good. We're doing good. How do you feel about your team so far, Britt? Um, honestly, I hate it. <laughs> um, I hate I hate drafting from the eleventh spot. Um, I hate drafting on the turn. Um, but I do think that I got some pretty good value with um, Mike Evans, Keenan Allen, getting Zamir White in the twelfth. I think I saw somebody in the chat um, say league winner. Right now, I'm safe. Um, this is pre-draft, so the draft can always come in there and screw some things up, as we've seen in the past. But right now, I'm feeling really good about Zamir White. Um, we saw him with. Josh Jacobs kind of going down. He was the guy. And so I feel pretty good about him. Um, I Will Levis, ugh, I was like, what are we going to do here? But I'm going to take a chance on him now that they got Calvin Ridley and they still have D-Hop. Rip, my poor sweet prince, Traylon Burks. I don't think he's ever going to get a chance to be that wide receiver one, unfortunately, at least for a while. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling mid about it, but it's still early. We'll see. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that that pick of Zamir White was fantastic to to get wow. him in the in the early twelfth round. Alexander Madison does not scare me at all. In fact, um, who was saying like there's actually plenty of people saying like it was a good thing for Zamir White's value that Madison was was who the Raiders signed um, to to sort of back up White. And White, I, I don't think he's necessarily a pedigreed guy, but Georgia guy that that you know had a lot of people a lot, a lot of fans of his uh coming into the NFL draft when when the Raiders took him and now you're getting basically a starting running back in the 12th round to go with uh Brees Hall and and Najee Harris as as well well Britt you said you didn't like you know the Will Levis pick was that more of a pick that you just wanted to make sure you got a third quarterback there yeah I was kind of looking at the quarterbacks who were available there and it was like Geno Smith and some of the rookies and I was like, you know, I'm just going to take a chance on this guy. Everybody knows that I was very low on Will Levis going into the draft last year. Um, I was at the draft and talking to some people and kind of got into some spirited discussions with some other reporters there about why Will Levis was not going to go in the first round. Barely made it um, into the second, but I did not think that his accuracy was good enough for the NFL. Now we've seen his arm strength, which has been great in Tennessee, but Maybe they go out and draft like Joe Alt, which has been the heavy favorite to go to Tennessee. If they can get that offensive line 
figured out that I think that Levis has a little bit more potential. And I'm just all about taking chances at this point in the off season. It's so early that we don't really know what's going to go on. And I'm going to be the person who reaches. I mean, hell, look at Brock Bowers. I reached for Brock Bowers because I have watched that guy play at Georgia for the past two years. I think that he's probably one of, like Dalton Kincaid, one of the best receivers, not only tight end receivers, but pure receivers in this class. So I'm just taking chances here. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> or well, and, and just and, in discussions. I love it. <laughs> and, and Britt, I mean, like, isn't this the time to be taking, taking chances, right? I mean, because like nobody knows, like we're all, we're dealing with imperfect, impartial, incomplete information, right? So like, if you feel something about a guy at a certain spot, like go out and grab him. Like there, I always say like, there's no bad picks after the 10th round. I might go earlier than that in, in this draft, you know, for drafting in March, because that Bowers pick, I mean, he's going, you get him at the five eleven here, who knows the pen upon where he lands in the NFL draft. He might be like an early fourth round pick and boom, you got two rounds of value on him, even though you reached on him in this draft. Yep. No. And that's what I'm really thinking. I'm imagining and maybe manifesting in a certain sort of way that he's going to go to the chargers. If the chargers don't trade away that pick, because who, else do they have for a receiver yeah. now they got rid of Keenan Allen Gerald Everett's a free agent they got rid of Mike Williams I mean they paid Justin Herbert that humongous contract they have to have somebody to throw to and with Bowers you know maybe they go for one of the wide receivers but I'm kind of thinking that Bowers maybe fits that system a little bit better so fingers crossed we're gonna see but <laughs> I like my guy you're not excited about him throwing to Quentin Johnston I mean Quentin Johnston has uh, bricks for hands, uh, unfortunately. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, well, I, I'm going to take somebody who does not have bricks for hands, uh, although he's a little on the short side. But that's OK. We love our short kings here um, on the show. So Josh Downs, come on down. And Josh snipe somebody down. out of my queue. Ah, that's so that's, that's great. This whole, this whole <laughs> row right here. I think I had just about every single one of these guys in my queue and it just like, boom, boom, boom. They're all gone. Well, I'm going to complete the Tennessee stack uh, with uh Chego Conquo there here. Um, there get another are. tight end. <laughs> See, we, 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 we just talked about this, Stacey. I mean, you talk about cheap stacks. Look what Britt did here. Levis, Hopkins, yeah. and now Conquo. So, I mean, there is something, there is something to that. Um, I, I, well, I'll, I'll save this Britt because I know you're, you're basically in the hole here and about to be on deck, but um, the, we didn't talk about your pick of Romeo Dobbs, Stacy in Ooh. the, uh, in the 12th round our from our beloved Packers, a guy that, um, you know, we talked about Watson versus Reed, but we can't forget about Romeo Dobbs either. No. And, you know, I mean, I'm required to get at least one Packer per draft, um, hopefully more. Um, but so far this was my first one. And um, so I went Romeo Dobbs. He's not my favorite of the receiver group. Um, however, in best ball, I really don't think that you can go too wrong with any of the receivers, you know, because at some mm -hmm. point it's going to be the Romeo Dobbs day. It's going to be probably more often than not the Jaden Reed day, Christian Watson, Dontavian Wicks, you know, all those guys are going to get their, you know, their time and to shine. And so taking him as one of my later round receivers you know, he was there. I liked him a little bit more than I liked some of the other options that were available at that point. Um, and, you know, bonus that uh, he's in green and gold. Yes, exactly. And I, I feel like Romeo Dubs got a bad rep last season because of the emergence of Jaden Reed. But if you look at Jaden Reed's stats and how touchdown dependent he was, I feel like Dubs is more of a maybe consistent guy, which is not necessarily what you go for in best ball. But he does still have that touchdown upside. And I can see some negative touchdown regression for Reed next season. I think that Dubs is the number one in that Green Bay offense. And you mm. got him at an absolutely bargain basement price. I mean, 12th round. I mean, I'm not not upset about that. I think that's the other thing to keep in mind, too. Like, we, we talked about Watson versus Reed for the number one receiver. What did we see last year? I mean, the Packers, it, did, did they even have a number one receiver? No, not really. And so that should leave all avenues open for, for this season. It wouldn't, um, I think, uh, who was it? It was a Packers beat writer. I think it was Matt. It was either Matt Schneiden or Rob Domofsky was asked last year, 
who's going to lead the Packers in, in catches. And I think it was Matt Schneidman. And he said Romeo Dobbs over Watson and over um, uh, Jaden Reed. And I think Dobbs was second on the team in receptions last year. It wasn't far off from Reed. And, mm-hmm. and as Britt just pointed out, 12th round for Romeo Dobbs. And where did Jaden Reed go in this draft? Um, much higher than that, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, six, six yeah. round. So yeah, give me that, give me that Dobbs value all day. hundred percent. I love it. Um, <laughs> so, so Conklin now was this, was this based on me saying, I thought he'd be a nice little tight end three sleeper, Stacy, or was this, was he already in your queue prior to that? No, I, I definitely let you influence me there because I, I was looking at, all right, who's, who's still left here. And I had it narrowed down and this is just so disgusting. Um, Hunter Henry, um, which I have no issue with Hunter Henry because I know Gina just took him. Um, but Hunter Henry and I, I was looking at Dawson Knox just because I know they're, you know, guys that are typically more so used in the red zone for their teams. Um, but I thought that maybe Tyler Conklin may have a little bit more, um, upside than those two guys. Um, Hunter Henry, you know, he had that two touchdown game, I think right at the beginning of the season. Um, and I looked like a genius for taking him in like the last few rounds of all my drafts. Um, and then the last part of the season, he just did nothing. And, and I kind of think they're going to be a particularly awful offense this year. Yeah. Um, so I thought, you know what, let's go with somebody who's got a little bit more, um, you know, potential to him. And, um, it didn't hurt that, uh, he was right there in the front of my mind since you had mentioned him. Britt, um, I want to ask you this, uh, you took Keenan Allen at the seven 11, that was seven picks. Uh, no, beg your pardon. That was, um, oh, where is it? I just had it now. Uh, with, uh, with DJ Moore, where did he go in this draft? He went early, I think. I think he went a couple rounds. Oh, I see it. And it's a three hundred one. Okay. Yeah. So, so okay. I, for for you, I mean, I, I mean, I'm kind of with you on this. I'd rather have the value on Keenan Allen. Moore is, I mean, that's really high. But when it comes down to fantasy production between those two this year, how do you see the Bears um, splitting that up as far as you know catches, yards, touchdowns, all the fantasy goodness we care about? I mean, it's really going to depend on how Caleb Williams, and we're just slotting him in there because we know that the Bears are going to draft him, how he can deal with pressure and how he can disperse the ball. I'm hoping that the Bears actually get another offensive lineman so they can give him a little bit more protection and he has options. Now, DJ Moore is really, really good against man coverage. He was the best among wide receivers all season last year against man. But Keenan Allen is so good working out of that slot that he's going to be that safety valve for Caleb Williams if the Bears do allow a ton of pressure. Keenan Allen's always going to be there. His hands are sure. His routes are crisp. Like, give me the 7-Eleven Keenan Allen over DJ Moore at, you know, that value all day long. Um, I just, I really hated that he went there, to be honest, because it did make that decision um, very difficult. But when it's a third round versus a seventh round, then it's a no-brainer. Yeah, and even like, you know, uh, in the FFPC Superflex number two early best ball tournament, you're, you're looking at DJ Moore at 408. And you're looking at Keenan Allen at, at 607. So he Allen slipped uh, quite a bit further in this draft. And then you can make the case that Moore almost was was grabbed about that same distance where he normally goes too. So I'm loving the value there with with Keenan Allen. Or excuse me. Yeah, Keenan Allen at the 7-Eleven. It's, it's a fantastic pick. Really good pick. Thank you. Thank you. It's just, I feel like there's a bunch of ageists in this draft, man. The rookies are going super early. <laughs> you know, like Keenan Allen, we know he's in his 30s, guys. I'm myself, I'm a sucker for 30 year olds, <laughs> you know, and, and I, but we were talking about that earlier where, you know, th- now's the time to draft rookies because, well, of course this one that there was some aggressive rookie picking, but you know, a lot of these rookies are going to go higher after they have real NFL homes. Um, and maybe mm-hmm. Allen rises in ADP too, when people get more comfortable with that. Um, especially in a managed league. Now this is best ball, so you don't have to worry about it. But in a managed league, like Keenan Allen's a lot more comfy of a pick um, because you know what you're getting in him. Stacy, I thought Britt's pick of Michael Wilson would have been intriguing for you with yes. Kyler Murray. But I don't really, you know, if, if they take Harrison and McBride, I mean, that is a ton of targets between those two. And then I don't know where Michael Wilson's left, but I guess it doesn't matter if it's best ball in his 14th round, you'll take it. Oh, yeah. And well, especially well, in, exactly in the 14th round, I was just going to say he was in my queue for sure. Cause I was thinking about, well, maybe I'll, you know, pair him up um, a little bit later, but, uh, but you got to him before I did. Well, my situation with Wilson, because I've had that same thought process, like, are they going to take Marvin Harrison? But I think that they might end up trading down and getting rid mm-hmm. of that pick 
Um, the Vikings obviously have to get a quarterback. They cannot be uh, pushed out of this quarterback class. There are no free agents left that really hit the mark, that really do anything for them. Um, I don't think that Sam Darnold is going to be the guy. I just, I know that he, you know, they paid him $10 million, but I still don't like what I've seen from him. I think that they're going to trade up into that four spot. And Michael Wilson, I know that all the talk has been on Greg Dortch. Mm -hmm. I think that Michael Wilson is a very talented receiver and he thrives in certain packages, not every single package, which he does have some development to do. But I think with a full year working with Kyler Murray and a full off season, we're going to be really surprised as to what he can deliver this season. I was, I was definitely on him in the third round of rookie drafts last year uh, in grabbing Wilson. I mean, I see the tools there. Like I see the athleticism, I see the playmaking ability. He just needs an opportunity. And that's the other compelling thing about taking Wilson in the 14th round. If they don't take Harrison, if they trade out of the pick, maybe they add an offensive lineman or they go defense or something. And, and then you're talking about adding a receiver in round two or round three, or do they No, I think they got the extra first round pick, but even still, like you're talking about, uh, you know, Wilson competing with, you know, Keon Coleman or, or Xavier worthy, or, you know, somebody like that, that's much better than competing with Marvin Harrison too. Yeah. So that's another good, you know, part of the upside of Wilson in the 14th. And it's all, again, we're so early that this is all speculation. I'm like dusting off the crystal ball, trying to figure out what's going on, who's what's going to happen. And a lot of this decision-making has come down to studying Vegas odds and seeing who's going to go at what position and just following Vegas. And Vegas is really seeming to think that Arizona is going to trade out of that fourth spot. And so I think that Wilson still has a shot to be that wide receiver one in this offense. Um, we got a uh, question from Ann Dunn, uh, Stacy here. Yes. And, and I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to put Britt on the spot because <laughs> she's on deck, but I'll leave it up to you. Yeah. Um, Adonai Mitchell, I, he's a and right? Instead of actually mm -hmm. Texas. So I remember the game that um, he played Arkansas two years ago, actually ended up breaking his leg. So he was out for the rest of the season. But up until that point, he was absolutely torching us. I think his body type is a little bit small for the prototypical wide receiver one, but his speed is going to get him involved in packages. So I think he's going to be a late day two, early day three guy. Mm. Um, but for best ball, I mean, throw your chips in on him. If he's speedy, as speedy mm -hmm. as he is, um, he's going to have some worth in this league. So I'm trying to make my pick and I'm so confused because <laughs> it's down to rookies and I don't like it. <laughs> so, so just, you know so what? I'm going to, I'm going to go right here and Ooh. we'll see what happens. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> there we go. Um, Adam Patworth and I were just talking about J.K. Dobbins, I promise you, like 10 minutes before we started. And um, we were like, are we ready to get hurt again? Is it a thing? <laughs> are we like going back to the, you know, to the ex that you've broken up with so many times and thinking that things are going to be different? We're like, is it going to be different now with J.K. Dobbins this year? Okay. So to borrow that analogy, <laughs> Dobbins is not exactly running with a highfalutin crowd of of social friends, right? It's not exactly making, you know, six figures and looking handsome and gorgeous. Like the, this is not the ex that we broke up with. This is somebody who is down on their luck that has had uh, some, 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 gone through some bad times. And so the risk of getting with uh, JK Dobbins once again, that's the 16th round. I mean, you go on a couple of dates, if it doesn't work out, you just move on and you don't feel so bad about it. And I just have this feeling that he is going to be a Dallas Cowboy. It's going to oh, be yeah. him or Ezekiel Elliott um, because they don't have anybody who can pass block. Honestly, they are we going to put Deuce Vaughn out there to pass block? Please. No, <laughs> we're not. Now, do I feel comfortable about J.K. Dobbins with all his injury history out there pass blocking? No, I don't. But that's the exact kind of thing that the Cowboys front office would do. And if he goes into this offense and is the number one back, he's got a ton of upside in that offense. I'm just crossing my fingers that he stays healthy. Yeah. And, and but I mean, and, and yes, you obviously want him to stay healthy too. But like when you talk about like it was kind of a, I don't want to say it's a luxury pick because you still need to build up your, your, your running back core, but like Hall, Harris, Samir White, Herbert, and then JK, JK Dobbins is your five. I mean, that's the type of 
upside play that you want as, as your number five running back. So yeah, that's another good pick there too. I, I, you know, the, the late, not that, that your early round picks were bad, but I'm really, I mean, the Zamir white pick, the Michael Wilson pick JK Dobbins. I think you can make some really strong cases for those guys here. I love to go Goodwill shopping and it shows up in my drafts. <laughs> 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 yeah, best ball dumpster diving. With yes. Flynn. Oh my exactly. gosh. Um, I have an Adam Thielen question for you guys. Um, so I was looking at his numbers today. Is he at the 14th most targets overall with 137 last year? Do you guys think that that's, I mean, I know he's old and I know that Panthers are, are bad, but I mean, Deontay Johnson's there now, but do you still think that he's going to have, I mean, probably not that many, but like, where do you see him falling as, as far as, you know, being as valuable as he seemed to be last year. I think in the 16th round, as far as best ball goes, he's going to be fine. Um, Like he's going to have touchdown upside because this offense can't get any worse, right? It has to go up. There's (laughs) nowhere to go, but up. Um, As far as targets, PPR, maybe not, but he's still going to be that guy. Like Mm -hmm. in, in the 16th round, he's still a, you know, commiserate, Pro, I think I don't know. I have a COVID brain right now. I can't use vocabulary <laughs> or words, uh, but I think he's still going to have plenty of targets and touchdown upside. And five rounds later, than Deontay Johnson went in yeah. this draft too. So, and and it, you know Johnson's the the new the shiny new toy for that offense. And and I do think there is at least a partial duplication of skills between Johnson and Thielen. Um, but maybe that's to Bryce Young's advantage. You know that that. These guys are such tacticians uh, and they have such good hands. I mean, that's what he needs. He needs guys that can help him move the chains and, and Thielen and Johnson can both get that done. And again, you know, we're, we're talking 16th round. We're talking about a guy that, that has been able to find the end zone and think about that stretch that he went through early, like the first third of the season or whatever it was. I mean, we saw him dropped at some FFPC leagues. I know I, uh, Stacy, I picked him up in a couple of Kentucky leagues. Yeah. People just outright dropped him. And then he just went scorched earth, which was great. Now he fell off the, 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 the edge of the earth uh, later on in the season, but that's okay because you, you know, you just want these guys at this point of the draft to be successful for a few weeks. And maybe that's the difference between, you know, mm-hmm. being a competitor and being a champion. Yes, absolutely. Well, now I think we're starting to get into like the part of the draft where like, I'm really struggling with these uh, rookie running backs. And I'm like, wait, who, which guy is that again? Hang on. <laughs> And this rookie running back class is not very strong. So I'm wondering at this point in the draft, like how many of them are even going to be picked up by a team or how many of these guys are just going to end up like practice squad fodder. Well, you know, it was, it was kind of like last year. Cause I just saw this name that kind of just triggered that, you know, same thing. Like I was so high on, you're going to laugh. Israel Abanacanda last year. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, he's going to come in and the jets and, you know, breeze is hurt. He's not gonna be able to play for a few games. And nothing did he do all year long and that that's what so worries me about taking any of these rookie well, run backs right now I'm feeling like I've got like PTSD with the with with the Abanacanda from last year I, I mean I'll let Britt weigh in on Abanacanda but like I, I I mean I think the process was right there I mean we we heard from a lot of people um of how good Abanacanda was in college and how his skill set translated for a lot of offenses in mm-hmm. the pros and when he ends up in New York, and and obviously Hall coming off the um, the uh, the ACL, um, yeah, I mean th- there was a lot to like about Abana Canada, and his price never really got out of control. So I was with you. I drafted him in a bunch of leagues last year. It didn't work out, but I still believe the process was was correct on Abana Canada. Brett, how did you feel about him coming into the draft last year? Yeah, I really liked him. I thought that he was a great dual threat back because he had great hands, um, great speed. Also watching hard knocks, you know, they cut mm-hmm. something else just to keep him. And at this point in the draft, this is where you take your stabs on those late round guys. This mm-hmm. is where people got Puka Nakua last season. Mm-hmm. Nobody was looking at Puka Nakua to be in best ball. And if you did, then you probably ended up advancing and winning some of your leagues, especially yeah. these FFPC best balls. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that this is the point in the draft where you do take people like that you never know when these guys are just going to emerge. It really is just kind of a dart throw, um, a roll of the dice. And if your process is correct, which I think it was with Abana Kanda, nobody expected Brees Hall to come back from that ACL injury as quickly and as effectively as he did. 
So I think that you were right there. Also, nobody expected Aaron Rodgers to go out on the first drive of the game. Yeah. <laughs> he screw their offense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you can't dog your process there. Oh, guys, I'm going to do something that I don't really love, but. Do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You know, it's going to be either him or J.K. Dobbins showing up on Dallas. I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing, the other thing uh, when did Elliot go? Did Elliot go to the Patriots prior to the start of last season, or was he after the season started? I honestly can't remember. I think it was prior to, right, but it was real close. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let, let's just say, I mean, and, and there's a chance this year he's not signed by the start of the season. He yeah. could be, but like – if he is signed, I mean, it's probably going to be for a team that needs a running back. And again, just getting a pocket or a window of like two or three weeks for a 17th round pick. I mean, that's kind of what you're looking at. And Elliot's been shown, or he's shown us that he's still a pass catcher. He still can get it done. I mean, he got it done for new England for a few games last year. So I know it, it's weird uh, <laughs> to, to think about Ezekiel Elliott being a um, even a potential difference maker here, but there, there could he could land in a really good spot for you, Stacy. Yeah, you know, I mean, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. We'll see. But uh, I don't think that's the way. You know, I mean, I just because I looked at my my roster and I was like, do you seriously only have like a couple running backs? Like you, yeah. you got to step it up a little bit here. Like you have you do have to start at least one. So, Britt, um, yeah. you just made uh, a couple of picks here. I want to talk about that um, seventeen eleven pick and Ricky Pearsall. This is a player that, and granted, you know, I follow college football as much as I can, but it's probably not as much as I should. This is a player that I didn't really know that much about um, up until, I don't know, a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago. I, I, I just saw him being taken in a lot of FFPC best ball drafts. And then I see on Twitter, there's a lot of people talking him up um, and you grab him here in the, at the end of the 17th round. What do you like about Pearsall and what he brings to the table? For one, I love his route running. Everybody likes to peg him as just a slot receiver, but he's so much more than that. And he has the speed that he can kind of, he honestly reminds me a little bit about a, a, a smaller Keenan Allen, mm. um, same route running great hands, but a little bit speedier. Um, he can get out of those routes. He can shake off defenders and he's played in that pro style system in Georgia for the past, you know, three or four seasons. Really love what he's done. He was on my college um, team the season in the first uh, FSGA college football championship or fantasy league um, did really well for me. And just watching him, I think that he's going to be kind of, you know, I'm just going to say it. Everybody's been throwing out this year's Puka Nakua. Maybe it's Pearsall. I've, let's, just, I've, let's just stamp it. <laughs> I've, and I've heard that comp before and I'm starting to hear it more and more too. And, and that's, I mean, I don't listen. Nakua was like a once in yeah, a he's, generation type player, but yeah. Pearsall could still have a really good season yeah. this year. I think so too. And I, you know, obviously it depends on landing spot where he's going to go, but his talent alone is just so good that I can't pass him up in the 17th. Do I want a scrub who's going to be like a practice squad guy, or do I want one of these rookies who could emerge yeah, and yeah. I'm going to go with the rookie. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what we're doing here. And we're in the 18th round now we've got 20 rounds to go. So, you know, we're doing dart throws at this point. We're looking for guys that are super talented. You know, that's part of the equation, right? You've got to be talented. You've got to have that opportunity too. We don't know what kind of opportunity he's going to have just yet, but I, I mean, it's probably going to be something with as talented as he is. Yep. Agreed. Davis Allen, another tight end that I had. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, yes. That came from my lips in this draft and now from my yes. lips, Stacey Perez's team. What's it? Absolutely. Which is fine. Like I, I, I love it. It's great. I, it's fantastic. Pick. I had, well, I had, I, I went back to the well here cause I just can't quit Dawson Knox. Um, you know, should something happen with Kincaid? Uh, you know, they, like I said, you know, Josh Allen does really like him in the red zone. Um, but, you know, I was thinking, look, Tyler Higby got injured real late last year. It's probably going to be a while before we see him on the field again, um, at least back to the level that he was at. So why not grab Davis Allen? Um, you know, see how that shakes out. He's my fourth tight end. Um, I just felt like since I waited so long after taking Cal Pitts that I kind of needed to shore that up just a little bit more. I have some more options. I don't normally love going four tight end sets um, here, but um, given that I waited a little bit, I thought it was probably appropriate, especially this late. What, Britt, do you have any strategy that you can offer the viewers or listeners of drafting in March, like how you can really capitalize on 
uh, the lack of the, you know, drinking from the fire hose of information we'll get in late August and early September. Because there's not a ton out there. And we haven't even had the NFL draft yet. And not all waves of free agency are done. Is there something that that you've been able to do or a strategy that you've been able to employ over the years to really capitalize on value here? Um, my strategy is no strategy at all. And just <laughs> go go with your gut. Because at this point, if you follow ADP, you're just going to end up with the most vanilla draft. You're going to not get any value whatsoever. You have to go with your gut at this point in the season. If you think that a prospect is going to A, end up in a good landing spot and or B, has great talent, take them. Take them whenever you want. Don't let them pass you by just because you can think or you think that you're going to get them in a couple rounds later. Um, also make sure that your build is balanced no matter who you take. Don't freak out because, you know, this guy got taken. Now I've got to take this guy. Just make sure that you really pay attention to your balance, which I did not do a great job of, admittedly, um, early on in this draft. Um, but yeah, I think, I think at this point, it's just mostly gut and finding value like, you know, Zamir White, like yeah. uh, JK Dobbins, things like that. Absolutely. Look at us. We are we are coming around to the end. We're in round 19 already. Guys, this is just like absolutely flown by. We're we're doing a great job here, everybody. Yeah, well, yes. Well, you guys are doing the heavy lifting. I'm just observing and, and enjoying myself. Um, the other uh tight end, and I should have brought this up. I forgot about him because he's a rookie, but he just went um with the second pick of the 19th round uh to uh to Heather Ann, the SFB veteran. Theo Johnson had was it a perfect 10 or a 9.99 RAS score at the combine? And he's another guy that's that's picking up some steam and drafts. You know, the other thing too is, it, you know, we talk about what you need to be doing with your picks late in the draft. Take athletes. Take a chance on the guys that 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 do the stuff that you can't coach. And Theo Johnson does a lot of stuff that that you can't coach because of his athleticism. Is he going to be a great tight end in the NFL? Who the heck knows? But it's the 19th round. And he, there's a lot to like about him. So that's another late tight end that I really like. And he's a 36 one off the board. Mm -hmm. And think about um, Gary Haddow, SFB nine winner mm -hmm. took Darren Waller way, way, way super yeah. late. Nobody really had any faith in Darren Waller. And he ended up literally winning SFB nine for Gary. You just, you never know if a guy's that athletic. I love I love seeing these picks too in the 19th round. It's just like it totally reminds me of drafts like last year at this point where like oh now KJ Osborne and the Taysom Hills and the Jalen Hyatts of the world, Deontay Foreman uh, is uh, they're all coming off the board in the 19th round. Some things never change, right? And these guys continue to be you know 19th, 20th round picks, um, it, which is you know just again it reminds me of drafting. Whatever time it was last year, these guys were all going late. Noah Brown's an interesting guy too at the at the nineteen oh three tonight. He went to Kelly Donovan, um, so I think that's an interesting pick as we near the ninetieth receiver taken in this draft. Ooh, yeah. I mean, he's he's on a great offense. I mean, yeah. I you know taking anybody on a on a really good offense, you know, you're going to have you you know a lot of potential there to score, especially in the nineteenth round. If you take a guy that has you know a couple touchdowns or something like that's paid for itself. Oh man, I'm thinking out loud to myself right here. I know it's ugly, right? It's it's getting ugly. Well, well and you have to keep in mind too. It's just like you have. I mean, this is like twelve sharks in in this draft. So everybody's sniping everybody, and it's it's so tough. I mean, like we talked about some of the value Brit found, but I mean the value has been tough. It's been few and far between. Well, I I'll give you my strategy as soon as I make this pick, but um. Mm -hmm. Go with your gut. You already told us. Go with your gut and get your gut. Right. <laughs> there, there are three guys. I'm trying to balance the rationality of my gut. Um, trying to balance it out. Get some probiotics in there and help me make this decision. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, man. All right, Brett, you're, while you're picking, I want to ask, Balky, like, what would you, like, as far as advice for, like, some newbies to best ball? Because I, I know just in talking to a lot of, like, the women that are participating in, you know, the tournament and everything, we have some, like, newer fantasy players, some, some ladies that are a little bit newer to this format. Um, like, what would be some, some advice that you might have for them? 
I, I think the thing is, is um, this is your team. You know, you can listen to all the advice that you want, and you probably should. You know, there's a lot of smart, there's a lot of smart people in this draft you should be listening to. But you know, ultimately, you need to go and 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 get your guys, get the guys on your team. Britt uh, hit it home with the balance aspect of it. I don't think that's talked about enough. Team construction is important. I also think it's important not to have a set team construction going into the draft. Um, as far as you want this many running backs by then, this many receivers by then, you can have those rules, but make sure that you're flexible. Make sure they're fungible. Make sure that they're not so rigid that it it, it prevents you from capitalizing on value later in the draft. If you start off a, a team with like four or five running backs, I mean, if there's a running back that falls late, you really can't take them because you're busy tacking the wide receiver in the tight end position. So I think it's important to to, to keep balance in mind and team construction in mind and know that in most drafts, there will be some value opportunities and you have to be able to capitalize on those because that's an easy way to set yourself um, at least, you know, from being an average team to a really good team to maybe a championship contending team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just, you know, you kind of, kind of take, sometimes you got to take what the draft gives you, like don't mm -hmm. necessarily be like set in your ways or, or, you know, if um, I think, who is it? Was it, I think, Bob Harris said last year, like, don't be a slave to ADP. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it, I think it, be, well, what does Farrell Elliott always say, Stacey, you, you follow ADP, you're going to draft a very, a very average team. St uh, Britt said yeah. earlier, you're going to have a very yeah. vanilla team if you do that. Um, so I, I think that ADP is fine to follow um, as a guide, but you should not mm -hmm. be like, oh, I can't take this guy as ADPs, you know, Great. four picks later or something like that. That's just, exactly. it's not, it's not, it's not even fun to play that way. No, not at all. You might as well set your team up on auto draft if right. that's what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, okay, so Jameis Winston yeah. is, is the pick here. Yeah. And, and so I thought this was interesting, Britt, because you I look at your team. You already had three quarterbacks, but you wanted the fourth in Winston. Why? Yep. Well, um, I don't think that Deshaun Watson wants to play football Ooh. anymore. Um, after... Flacco went to the Colts. Um, they brought in Winston to be the backup. Yeah. I don't think that Watson, even if he does still want to play football, which is still very much up in the air, has the durability or the um, the health that we want to see. So I think that Winston still does get some uh, a decent amount of playing time. He's got weapons. He's got a balanced running game. Uh, he's got a much better coach, I think, in Cleveland than he did in New Orleans with Dennis yeah. Allen. Um, for a 19th round pick, like let's give me a backup in case one of my or two or three of my quarterbacks get hurt because we saw the quarterback injuries last season. I think about the, the connection that Winston had with the Saints and that coaching staff and and how much he loved his teammates there. Yeah. What what must it have taken for him to leave that situation and that environment? He must really like at least what he's hearing or what he's seeing in Cleveland. So yeah, I think that is actually something to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And then with Bellinger uh, going back to the Darren Waller retirement situation, you know, what yeah. happens if, if Waller gets hurt and or retires? Like I don't hate Bellinger for a 20th round pick. So at this point I'm just throwing darts. I'm throwing spaghetti to the wall and seeing what it's sticks. What sticks. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> a big Bellinger fan before they you know got Waller last season and I, I don't in the 20th round my gosh I don't hate that at all that's great well and he did so well even before you know he had that really gnarly eye oh, injury eye. yes mm -hmm. and I mean he was doing pretty well before that happened so we're gonna see but I don't hate it for the 20th right yeah oh. yeah it's hard to hate any 20th round picks you know right. it's just everybody's gonna do what they're gonna do um Yes, yep. I knew someone was going to do it. Yep. <laughs> yes, I put a challenge out in the chat earlier. I was like, who is going to be brave enough to take Corderell Patterson? I am I am so glad somebody pulled that trigger. I love yeah. it. Oh, man. I couldn't do it, even though I had nausea. I was like, I, I just refuse. I flat out refuse. Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, my gosh. Well, Brett, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Make sure to tell everybody where they can find you online. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at Britt underscore Flynn, um, two T's, F-L-I-N-N, -N, um, over on Fantasy Alarm once we get NFL content rolling. Um, I've also started writing at Club Fantasy, so go check out some stuff over there. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it right now. 
Excellent. And Balky, thank you so much for coming on. Um, you're amazing. I just, I always love doing shows with you um, <laughs> and sharing your, you know, just being so generous with your time tonight. Uh, make sure to tell everybody again, remind everyone where they can find you and um, what are some things you've got working on right now? Yeah. At Eric Balkman uh, on the X, uh, follow FFPC there at, uh, at FFPC, obviously. Um, High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour still goes live uh, on the FFPC YouTube channel, 10 o'clock Friday nights. Uh, we got the Rotoviz High Stakes Lowdown back again for another season. That's going off at um, 10 o'clock on the first Tuesday of every month. Um, and then we will go to weekly once the NFL season starts. And then, of course, the Better Sports Network, we have the High Stakes Fantasy Football Show uh, each and every Thursday night. That's a two-hour show that starts at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So a lot in the hopper. Going to be a great season. Absolutely. Um, again, thanks to Erica for coming on, joining us. Thanks to everybody in the chat, everybody who drafted tonight. Um, we will be back again, late night version on Thursday, 10 p.m. Um, get your nap in before uh, we draft so you can stay up and be in the chat. Um, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you get notifications when our shows are going to be. And uh, we will see you all on Thursday. Good night, everybody.